like to welcome you to the keynote address of the 2015 Green Party Annual National Convention. Um, our speaker this afternoon is James Lane. Um, he's born and raised in New York City, um, lived for many, many years in Harlem, and he now lives in the, the borough of Brooklyn. Like so many of us here, James was brought into the Green Party in 2000 by Ralph Nader. Um, he has been working with the Green Party ever since then, um, helping build it into what it is today. It took him, though, 15 years to make the ultimate decision to run for office. He ran for Congress in a special election um, this past spring in the borough of Brooklyn and part of the borough, uh, the borough of Staten Island and partly Brooklyn as well. The congressman who, um, who had vacated the seat had been indicted last April on 20 charges of federal corruption. Even though he was reelected, he decided um, in December that he was, gonna, he was gonna step down. He was shamed into doing that. The man, one of the men who James ran against was the district attorney for the borough of Brooklyn who refused to indict the police officer who murdered Eric Garner. And that's a decision that angered and upset so many people. And I believe all of our hats should be off to James for willing to take that decision to run for office. He's been motivated to do that for many, many reasons. One of which, no doubt, was the fact that as a 16-year-old, he found himself handcuffed and sitting in the back of a police chart simply because he was a young black man. And he knows in his heart, he knows in his heart that he could have been Eric Garner all those years ago. It is my honor and my deep privilege to introduce to you James Lane. Thank you, everyone. Man, David's intro just messed me up big time. <laughs> because I, I tell people, if people see me on the street when I'm, I was running for office this time around, I said, oh, you know, because they know me as doing back, background organizing. They know me as like, you know, trying to get names, people to sign petitions, uh, trying to help build databases, trying to videotape protests and rallies, great things that all of us Greens are doing every day. But, you know, the major media doesn't cover it. So they know me as like, you know, James the camera guy, James the database guy, or whatever. And so now they started calling me James the politician. <laughs> and I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> Don't insult me like that. <laughs> because, you know, in this country, politicians have given politics such a bad name. You know, it, they're not politicians. They're, they're just shills for, for the corporate masters. I mean, they're, they, all the things that you've elected them to do, they don't care about. They only care about where they're getting their money from. So when someone calls me a politician, I say, wait a minute, brother. <laughs> no, no, I'm a political activist. I want to change the situation that we're talking about right now. And so David's intro just now reminded me of why I consider myself a bad candidate at times, because so many issues that are so important affect me so much on a personal level that it's sometimes hard for me to talk, because I know myself going through certain issues, or family members, or friends, and you know, these are things that are not just, you know, campaign stump speech items. These are real things that affect people. I mean, these are real things that, I, I'm just gonna pick one instance of my life, right? So we talked about, you know, being 16, locked up, well, arrested for waiting for a friend at a subway station. This abusive cop comes over to me telling me, you know, what are you doing on this train? You know, get on that train and get up the F off the station, he tells me. And I'm like, what did I do? And I asked him again. It's like, he says the same thing again. I'm like, but I'm waiting for a friend. And he says, okay, you want to do it the hard way, huh? So he slaps these handcuffs on me, he marches me upstairs, you know, waits for, calls for backup, waits for his partner to come, drives me from 96th Street up to 125th Street, and all along the way, he's talking about how he should just take me into the park and beat the hell out of me and leave me for dead. And I'm like, what kind of sick person is this that's on the force? And I'm thinking, oh, you know, that's just me, you know? Something inside of me said, this guy is crazy, let me just shut up, because something, might, something worse might happen to me. But then, you know, as I got older, and I hear about more and more cases, especially in New York, you know, like there's a, a case of Anthony Baez, he's, he's playing football in the Bronx, and his football hits a police car, and the 
police officer chokes him to death, basically. And this is like a year after chokeholds have been prohibited <laughs> in, in New York. And, you know, and here we are talking about Eric Garner once again. This is like, what, 30 years after that? And so all of these issues that we're talking about, and like I said, this right now is just police brutality. All these issues affect me and so many other people I know so personally that it's hard for me to talk about them in a scenario like this without tears flowing like they are now. Homelessness. So many times in my life, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I work, I do what I can do, but in New York City, it's hard to work and pay your rent and pay for all these other things. So, so many times before I was married, I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be homeless in two seconds. And then something miraculously would come up. Like I used to have this penny jar full of glass. And there was one time I just had like no money and I just smashed that thing all open. And I lived on that for about a month of just pennies, walking to work back and forth, eating two $4 cookies to, to keep me alive. You know, this is no way for anyone to live. So when people talk about homelessness and, and food justice and all these items, yes, I've been through it. And yes, I know a lot of people that have been through it. And so these are the things that in 2000, when I heard about Ralph Nader, running for the Green Party as president. I remember him as a child. When I was seven years old, I remember seeing the Mike Douglas show, and he's on, on with like John Lennon and Yoko Ono talking about civil, civic engagement, you know, getting people organized, you know, and, and the power of the vote and all these things. And you know, at the time I was a kid, I was like, you know, what's this all about? And I asked my mom, and she's like saying, you know, listen to him, what he's saying, it makes sense. And then so, you know, 30 plus years, or 30 years later, He's running for president. So I'm like, oh, it's time to listen again. Let's see what he's talking about. Because in 2000, I was 35 years old, and I've never voted. I've never registered to vote. And the reason why was because, as David mentioned, I grew up in Harlem. I grew up in Harlem in the 70s, early 80s. And there were so many injustices that I would see going around. I remember, you know, People going and talking to their local city, you know, their congressman or city council person and saying, hey, you know, either the neighborhood's falling apart, you know, we have this, crime is rising, this and that. All these issues going on and all these abandoned buildings and, and just a lot of issues and people going to their elected officials crying out for help. And all they can say, well, you know, there's nothing we could do for you. Oh, nothing we could do. There's no money for you. You can't really do it. Yeah, there's nothing we could do. And then, you know, around November, they come around asking for your vote. <laughs> and I'm like, man, you didn't do your job for the last two years. Why should I give you my vote? Because people just feel that they're entitled to it. And I don't say people, I say these politicians feel they're entitled to your vote. And so with that in mind, I said, well, there's no way. I can, I'm, I'm a person, I can't hire somebody that's doing a bad job for me, you know, to, to continue to do a bad job, especially when it's, so many important things at stake. As I mentioned, you know, lives, lives matter to everything these politicians control. So anyway, so like I said, I didn't vote 17 years. Finally, found out about the Green Party, and man, I was so happy. Because first of all, this is a party that back then, they had 10 key values I had to memorize. I'm like, 10 key values? <laughs> This is a lot. Okay, I'll try it. You know, I was going through feminism, decentralization, blah, blah, blah. And so, you know, years later, I'm glad it's like, oh, just four pillars? I got that. <laughs> that, that made a lot of difference in, in getting people involved in the green. So thank you, whoever said four pillars. <laughs> because that, that brings in so much more under that. Um, it, it's amazing, though. Because with this organization, it, it is really that. It's not just a, an organization that runs a candidate for a November <laughs> election and then they disappear. We're around day after day, minute after minute, doing things, organizing, talking about what to do, talking about issues that are all around. You know, and it could be, like my, my 15 years of being a Green, I remember, you know, there's issues around fracking, there's issues around Pipelines going in all around our state. There's issues around, you know, the women's right to choose. There's like all these issues. And we're always, because we're Greens, they all fund their, fall under our umbrella 
of, of things that we can champion. Now the unfortunate thing in this world is that we don't get the credit we deserve for doing these things. And this is something that I've really felt horribly about because going back to fracking, in New York, a lot of the groups, the environmental groups and such that we were working with the stop fracking in New York, were saying, well, let's call for a moratorium on fracking, you know, that would be good enough. And the Greens were the only ones that stood strong and said, no, an all out ban on fracking, no to fracking. Frack no, right? <laughs> that, was, that was our thing. And because of that, the rest of the group picked up on it, picked up on it, and now they have a ban on fracking, you know? And, and there was applause that goes out to all the Greens in New York that were, were, were steadfast and saying, we're staying by this because it is so important. You know, but there's, you know, the government, you can't trust them. You just can't trust them because even though there's a ban on fracking, there's not a ban on pipelines that could be bringing in frack gas. So that's the next battle in that, in that issue. Going back to my congressional run, I will, because I want to focus on why I'm up here right now. Last year, last Friday, Eric Gardner was strangled to death on Bay Street in Staten Island. And I was away in film school in, in uh, Amherst, Massachusetts, at Hampshire College, at a film program, learning how to make my video storytelling better so I could produce 28 minute segments to share on, on cable news access, you know, public access. Because I, I felt that everything we were covering needed to have public shows, and I wanted to help other people do the same too, so that we could all have our own channels, because as I said before, the major media is not gonna cover a lot of things we're doing, a lot of the things we're talking about, a lot of the issues that we're fighting for. They're not gonna cover it. Forget about it, because they're owned by the corporations that own the cops, that own the, <laughs> own the media, that, that it's, it's all connected. Follow the money, it's all connected. So I was up there learning about this, and you know, I came back from class one night, and I saw Man strangled to death by NYPD in Staten Island. I'm like, are you kidding me? You know, 20 years after Anthony Baez, th th this is going on again? Again, another strangled death? And I saw the video and I, I threw up because all those, all those traumas, all those things that I know from so many people of, of police brutality, it was just so much, it was too much to bear. And and I still, still to this day, I watch that video and I just, it's not even a strangling, but it's Eric's words. Not the I can't breathe words, but everything he said up to that about, you're always doing this to me. You know, I'm tired of this. This stops today. I know that feeling. And I know so many other people that know that feeling because this is what the power structure does. And it is so disgusting to me when being a part of the Black Lives Matter movement, and we have to have a debate about, well, what was Eric doing before then? I mean, why didn't he just let the cop arrest him? <laughs> it's like, so it's automatically the victim is the criminal here. What kind of world is this? So these are the things that personally affect me, and it's about truth and justice. And as Green Party members, we all are I don't like to say soldiers, but we, we all fight for truth and justice in our party. Democracy, ecology, right? Right? Nonviolence, social justice. These are all things, these are our four pillars, and these, is, these are the things that are so important to human life and, and planetary existence. <laughs> you know, and it's funny too why I said planetary existence because. A lot of my, my brothers and sisters in the Black Lives Matter movement that I've been talking to about joining the Green Party and getting involved, you know, they're coming in and they're all into it. But, you know, it's funny because sometimes my brothers and sisters have problems. They're like, yeah, I'm all for this, but I don't get this environmental part. I'm like, oh my God, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and then I have to show them the connecting dots. You know, it's like, we do realize that the asthma rates in, in communities of color are so much higher than in, in richer, and why is that? It's because when they put up these things like waste transfer stations and, and all these trucking decisions and whatever, these are things that affect your community. So once you start connecting those dots and showing that decisions that are being made are being made against you, then they wake up and they're like, oh my God, 
Now I see it. So, and that's what we do as, as Green Party members. We're not just members of a, of a political organization. We're activists, we're teachers, we're leaders. We do everything. We're a one-stop shop for making a better world. <laughs> you know, and, and so I, I look at my recent congressional run in Staten Island. Well, I say, keep saying Staten Island because it actually covers, District 11 in New York covers Staten Island where Eric Garner was killed and Hurricane Sandy devastated a lot of homes over there. And also areas of Brooklyn, Bensonhurst, Bay Ridge, Gravesend, Diker Heights, you know. And, um, but when I first jumped into that, that area to look at like which, which sections of the district can we really make an impact, we said we have to stay on the North Shore. Because as soon as we went out to Staten Island, it was right in our face at like the disparities, you know. I, I, I mentioned, People, people feel uncomfortable when I tell them this, but I, even last week it came up again. There's an expressway that goes through Staten Island, right? A little bit towards the middle of it, closer to the top of it. It's an expressway, and people in Staten Island call it the Mason-Dixon line. And this is 50 years after we're celebrating these Supreme Court rulings for the Voting Rights Act and all these things, and the marching across bridges, but they call it that now. And so we said, you know what? We have to stay in this section of Staten Island. You know, we're probably going to lose this election because we're not being strategic on how to win this campaign. But, you know, we're going to make an impact here. We're going to let people know that the Greens are here and that they have a voice in, in our party. So there were days I would just, you know, against my campaign's better judgment, <laughs> I would just go out as a rogue and I would go out and walk up and down Bay Street because that was a street where Garnick was killed. It's also, ironically, at one end of Bay Street was where Dan Donovan, the <laughs> district attorney that failed to indict him, lived. He lived on the, the really fancy side with you know, the high rise, and when I walked over to the side where the ferry was, that's where all my brothers and sisters were fighting to survive and talking about these issues of police brutality that they've been going through. And I met so many amazing people and they all embrace what we do as the Green Party. They all embrace, embrace all of our issues, and they wanted to become more involved. The saddest thing about it was, a lot of them were stuck in this pipeline of prison thing that we talk about. A lot of them said, I'm sorry, brother, I, I support you, but I can't vote for you. I'm like, why can't you vote for me? I've been convicted of this, I've been convicted of that. I'm like, well, you know, what was the situation? It's like, well, the police said this, the police said that. And I'm like, oh, and once again, another way to strip away your power at the most basic level. You know, people talk about, you know, it's your right to vote. You know, citizen engagement is horrible in this country. It's such voter apathy. You know, people don't vote anymore. Well, you know what? People can't vote when you take their right away from them. Yes. So it is so upsetting and disgusting to me that people will say that kind of thing. You know, in, in my opinion, I think that, so what, he committed a crime. Why is his right to vote stripped away until he's, you know, he serves his, his uh, probation and all that kind of stuff? That is just disgusting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so, you know, that's one of the issues. Other people I ran into, you know, they said, I can't register because I don't have a home right now. I'm living in a shelter. I'm living in a shelter with three other people, and, and it was amazing to me, people that I met out there that were in shelters, so many people that were living in shelters on Staten Island. And they talked about these communities that they would build, like sub-communities, to sort of help each other out. Because when you go into the shelter system, you're only allowed to bring like one or two items with you. And if you have like children that you gotta support, what are you supposed to do? I'm oh, sorry, kids. Um, I can only bring one or two things, and you're just going to have to fight over these little bit of things I could bring in. So I found these amazing people. They would bond together, and they'd cook meals for each other, and they'd trade resources within each other. And it, it just made me feel like, first of all, we shouldn't even have this situation. But it, was, it gave me like a, a, a glimmer of hope that people like that existed that would help each other out rather than fighting over scraps. Because this is what usually happens in poor communities. You know, this is why crime goes up. You know, one group of people feel they don't have anything 
and they have to take from somebody else, even though they're in the same community, which is so, so sad, you know, because we all should be bonding together and using that energy to go against the real people, the real causes for why we're in this situation. We should be bonding together and going against these politicians, going against these corporations. You know what? Stop fighting over who's got better sneakers. Stop buying those damn sneakers. You know, it, it's just, it's, it's so upsetting. But, you know, we're Greens, we're, we're hopeful people. We, we see that we could do so much with our party. And I feel like over the last 15 years, we've done a little bit to really bring awareness to it. But this year, it seems like a crossroads to something amazing because so many more people are, are getting involved and, and, and they're waking up. I mean, that's the only way I can really say it. I mean, the fact that people are actually coming out and saying that, you know, the system is horrible, and 30 year Democrats I've met, they've been changing the registration of Greens, and they just see time and time again. You know, they see things like this TPP thing that they voted for, you know, where they voted no, they voted yes, they voted no, they voted yes, you know, and, and people are seeing, these are all games that they're playing, and at the end of the day, it's costing us jobs. It's, it's costing, you know, health care and, and housing and, and all these all these problems are being created by these people that are playing games. These, like I said, these politicians, they need to be out of office because what they're doing is they're just using their, their titles as a career for themselves. They don't care about us. They don't. You know, and if anyone tells me, oh, no, well, there's a good politician out there, I was like, oh, yeah? Let me see, how many of them can say Black Lives Matter? I know right now. I know right now, when I was running, you know, of course, Dan Donovan's not gonna say it. Well, <laughs> I'll talk about him later, even though I want to. But the Democratic candidate that was running against Dan Donovan for Congress with me was at an NAACP forum with me, and somebody asked, as a city council person, this particular guy, these two police officers got killed in New York, and he had these little blue signs made up, say, go blue to support the local police. Great. And so somebody challenged him on that and said, well, we saw that you sent out this thing for support the NYPD when the two officers got killed, but what about, you know, when black people are getting killed every 28 hours at that time, uh, do you have anything that says Black Lives Matter in your offices, and you support that? And it's like, and he came back with the usual response, all lives matter. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> but we're saying, well, who would you put something that says black lives matter? And he continued to say all lives matter. You know, and so, and this was the thing that was so disgusting to me because this is the guy that's supposed to be running against Dan Donovan who <laughs> couldn't indict the killers of Eric Garner. This is their champion. Someone who, he's saying right now, Eric Garner's life does not matter. And this is the guy I'm running against? Are you kidding me? So it was so disgusting. But you know, they feel they're entitled to your votes. They feel they could just be the Democrat and you're gonna vote for them because they're the Democrat and that's it. But you know, that time is gone. People are seeing it now. We've seen it in New York. In our last statewide elections, it was a 28% voter turnout. We were like the lowest in the country because people are so disgusted with it. Lowest. And, and an argument is, at the same time, they had a Gallup poll that said 50 to 60% of the country want to see a third party. So, so all these people that always spit numbers to us and talk about, oh, you don't have a chance to win because your poll numbers say this or whatever, they should look at those numbers and say, well, it's interesting how voter apathy, as you call it, seems to be bring down the voter turnout down to 28%, but the need for a third party seems to be going up each year. So really, what my number says is that our Green Party candidates should be winning with 70% of the vote in every election. Right. You know? And, and they would be, but the system is made so that's not gonna happen. And so that's what we need to do, is we need to think about what we're gonna do to change this system. And we're, a lot of us are doing work right now. We're, we're talking about electoral reform. We're talking about, you know, creating new media, creating independent media, truly independent media. I mean, within us, 
We're the ones that have to create this stuff. And then other people pick it up and they see it. I want to go back again about issues because, as I mentioned, the media is only going to let you know about a few things. With my campaign, I was surprised. We were all surprised. I was actually getting picked up by the media when I was running because I, I did run in 2013, but that was more of like a protest campaign for public advocate. It's a weird position in New York that nobody knows anything about. But I was looking at the mayoral choice, choices that were going around, and the current mayor, mayor Bill de Blasio, I knew he was going to be a horrible mayor. <laughs> and I said, well, if he's going to be mayor, then I have to be public advocate to make sure that the things he's pro proposing doesn't go through as smooth and easy for him. Um, but you know, <laughs> didn't get much coverage back then. But in this election, we did get a lot. But it was strange because they wouldn't mention. They would mention that I'm running for Congress against, you know, Dan Donovan and this guy Vincent Gentile, the Democrat. But they wouldn't mention the Black Lives Matter issue. They were very, very careful to mention that this was your voice against police brutality. This is your voice against this injustice that has let his killers go free. This is your voice, you know, against a 15-hour minimum wage, $15 an hour minimum wage. This is your voice against decriminalizing marijuana. Like, they, they were very particular on what they wanted to say. I was even on, on Fox and Friends <laughs> and, and talking about issues. And they said, you know, well, as a Green Party candidate, you know, you don't really have a chance in New York, you know, to win. And I was like, well, yeah, maybe not in New York City. It's going to be tougher. But in New York State, we have, you know, mayors and we have all these people. And then they instantly cut me off and change the subject. <laughs> because the media doesn't want to know your power. The media does not want anybody outside this room to know how powerful each and every one of you are. They don't want, you, they don't want people to know that because that's going to be a revolt. And that's going to be a revolution that so many people out in the street have been calling for. Every, every brother and sister I know that's either working with immigration, you know, issues where, you know, they have family members that are feared of being deported, if they're dealing with you know, Black Lives Matter issues, which covers everything from police brutality to mass incarceration, you know, all of these issues are all connected. The homelessness, hunger, healthcare, all of these things. They don't want you to see solutions. And you know, everyone that you talk to says, well, you know, the only way you can really change anything is if we have a revolution in this country. You know? But, right? But, you know, when you say you need a revolution, what does that mean? Like, you know, people aren't going to pick up rifles and take over the White House. They're not going to do that. But we need to do a revolution within the system that they're currently controlling and bust through to that. We need to have a green revolution. We need to show people that the numbers of, that we can acquire, the numbers that we can mass together to make change is so huge that nobody could deny us our rights anymore. So that's, that's long and short of what I wanted to talk about today. I mean, like I said, there's so much work we have to do as Greens, and we know it. And there's times we get discouraged because we feel like everything we're doing is falling on deaf ears or whatever, but we gotta keep doing it. Well, I mean, there's just way too many issues. There's way too many injustices in this world. From, from costly wars we're spending trillions of dollars on, that can be brought back to our communities to be rebuilding our schools, re rebuilding our, our housing, to give affordable health care, free health care, free schools. I mean, we can have so much here, but we need to fight for it. You know, people talk about this is the greatest country in the world. We have so many freedoms. This country's not so great. <laughs> It's really not. Right, the freedoms that we've got, people had to fight and die for these freedoms. Is that really a country that's full of freedoms? No, you have to fight for every one of these freedoms. And these are freedoms that are basic human freedoms that everyone should be allowed to have anyway. So these are all things that are, are really important, I feel. I mean, I don't know how everyone else feels in the room, but I think that we have a solid opportunity in all the elections, not just next year's presidential election, because I know a lot of people are focusing on that now, but in all elections, special elections that come up, you know, any kind of elections that come up, we 
need to organize. We need to let people know that we exist. And we need to call out the current people that are running for office to re replace whoever's horrible and say, okay, they say they're good, but what about this? I'm gonna throw a name out right now, Bernie Sanders. Everybody I run into is like say, yeah, but do you think you know, the Greens will endorse Bernie Sanders? I'm like, <laughs> why? Why would we endorse Bernie Sanders? <laughs> you know, he doesn't, if, if, if he was a green, that would be a different discussion, but he's not. His policies are not green. Right, we're not for sale, exactly. Hello. So these are things that we all have to hold through. And like I said, you know, I look at Staten Island, this, this recent election in Staten Island, and to me that was like a, a test area for something that we, we started to do out there. The election didn't work out the way I wanted to, obviously, because they're not calling me Congressman Lane. <laughs> But we, we planted some serious seeds out there. And we haven't left the community. We still go out there. I go out there whenever I can. There's a, a comic book shop that I go out to visit now. And <laughs> whenever I go out there, I also come and see, you know, for my son. I have a 10-year-old. It's not for me. <laughs> and so when I go out to visit the comic book shop, I usually go by and stop by all the people that I met out there. Because it's so important. I mean... The bond that I made with them over those 60 days of running that campaign were true bonds. They weren't something I was trying to get a vote. I mean, I, people are struggling, people are hurting, and I can't turn away from that. I don't think anyone in this room can turn away from that. And there's so much injustices out there. Right now they're going through another campaign for a district attorney out there. And it's funny, it's the same thing, a Republican and a Democrat running for district attorney and they're both fighting for the same party lines because they're exactly the same candidate. So, you know, they're going to wind up with some conservative right-wing kind of person that's going to continue to let, you know, police issues run, run rampant. And we need to be there to support them. They have a lot of issues out in Staten Island that I didn't even go through, like, you know, people that were affected by Hurricane Sandy you know, still waiting to get their homes rebuilt. They're living in tents. We have other issues of people that are being, or are afraid, deathly afraid, that they're building this project on the North Shore of Staten Island. If this makes sense to anybody here, they're building a Ferris wheel. They're calling it the New York wheel. <laughs> and it's supposed to bring money into the community. And it's so amazing, because everybody knows, that's in the community, knows that people are just gonna take the ferry, over to Staten Island, ride the wheel, and ride, go right back. There's no money going to be going back into the community. But what's scary is they're doing all this development around there. So people that are already having a hard time right now are already facing, where am I going to move if they start raising these rents, they start pushing us out. And that's what they look at when they look at the police presence, at the police issues of police brutality there. Is that unfortunately the police is part of that real estate push. And we know this, you know, people don't like to talk about it a lot, but it's true. Whenever you see a, a heightened level of police activity, it's always in community of colors, in the projects, in like struggling areas. And it's a way to sort of intimidate those people out of those areas. And it, it's, it's really sad and it's, like I said before, people are waking up and they're seeing it. I think they're not waking up fast enough, but they are waking up and we need to be there to support them and give them help when it happens, exactly. So that's really all I had to share with you all today. I mean, the most important thing is we need to be there for the people. We need to show the people that the Green Party is a party of the people. We don't take corporate donations. We know this. But there's more to that. We have integrity. Our four pillars are solid. All of our candidates are solid against those pillars. If we ever found a candidate, I don't know what would happen to him if we found a candidate that snuck through and said, oh, yeah, I'm green, yeah, yeah, checking off all the boxes, saying I'm this guy, and if we found out that he was the other way, I'm afraid of what you guys would do to him. <laughs> because we're green to an extent. <laughs> um, we're, we're really solid with our, with our morals and our integrity. And I, I just want to thank everyone for 
listening to me. I want to thank the organizers of this meeting for allowing me the opportunity to talk to you all and to talk about what I just recently went through in, in, in this election. And hopefully, we'll walk away thinking about what we can do in communities that are, are being threatened with the people that are, are being oppressed and depressed in this, this horrible, abusive system that we have. What can we do to make it better? What can we do to bring more people into our party? Because we need to do this. The Democratic Party has, has outlived its usefulness. The, Yeah, they, they should just not be even around. They shouldn't even bother ra running candidates because it, it doesn't make sense. What's interesting is, I like on the Republican side, Donald Trump is like their new fear of like this third party candidate that's gonna take all the, the votes from the Republicans. So it's really strange. But the Democrats need to just give up and the Greens need to replace that void. Because we are the true party of the people. So once again, thank you all. And there's so much more I want to tell you, but I know we're on time limits. And I just I wanted to open up for questions and answers now. Thank you. All right. Thank you, James. Um, are there any questions? Answer then. <laughs> you asked for it. So my full name is James Curtis Lane. But when I was 23, I found out that I was adopted. Both my parents had died, and I had to take care of all the financial stuff and whatever. And I found out that I was a male gamble. And it wasn't until two years later that I finally found my mother, after 48 years of her wondering where her baby was, that she told me my name is Victor Gamble. So that's my long answer <laughs> to your short question. And this was why I ran in 2013. As I said, it was more of a, a protest thing, just to bring awareness to the fact that we talk about the pipeline to prison, adoption and foster care. These are all parts of the pipeline to prison. I know, I know so many people right now that are in a situation and they're, they're young kids that are gonna be aging out and they have no future ahead of them. And it's, it's scary, the numbers out there, and it's something that I wanted to raise at a higher level. And actually, I should have mentioned before, the Green Party of New York State, thanks to the openness of the Green Party, and which is why I love being a Green Party member, we submitted a platform item, and now that's part of our, our platform. So it's like, you know, because we looked at it, it's like, how can we have animal rights and gay rights and women's rights and not adoptee rights. I mean, animals had more rights than adoptees at that point. So we have an adoptee rights platform. So yes, that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. We're gonna have to wrap up because the, um, um, the workshops, workshops are just about to get started. Um, Tom has a real quick um, announcement she'd like to make. But again, before I turn the mic over to her, can we give another round of applause and thank you for being here?